right, so starting with the soil, since that is the theme of the day or the conference. So, you know, this is, you'll see pictures of different hoop structures and, you know, we've morphed and grown and kind of stayed with some of the basic systems in the, uh, over the years. But like this was, I don't know, five, six years ago, pasture. Again, we're in an area where there's homes everywhere. This is a field, um, homes right across the street. This field was 100 and some odd feet wide by 1,000 feet long. It's three acres and two and a half acres and change. We ran sheep and broilers in this field. This is a field that was a vegetable field for a while, and we put it down to a pasture for a uh, SAR grant that we got. Um, and you can't really see because the color's not really there, but you can see the, the glistening light on the lush pasture there, and that's a reflection of the uptake of nitrogen in the um, manure uh, from the broilers that were, were running to up and down this field. So this field was a field that we sowed down to a pasture blend, and we kind of put the birds a little bit early on the field, and because we had, um, you know, the broilers in a, in a high density setting like that, really lay down a lot of manure, really hot. If the field isn't, if the grasses aren't really strong enough, you can, you know, burn some holes in the grass and it won't come back. And that's what happened in that picture. You know, you can see the barely, barely the, the impact of the fertility of the, of the broilers. So and just a, we didn't say this earlier, but like because we live in the suburbs of Boston, uh, we don't have like one big tract of land. So we've all of our systems that we've designed have been because we've got three acres here and five acres there and a 15 acre field over here and a two acre field over there. So we're constantly moving things around between like driving st stuff down the road at night with a tractor pulling coops behind us um, because we don't have one massive big field. So um, when we've gotten to be able to get enough land where we are, we've been sharing it with other vegetable farms. It's like if someone's going to take it out of inter, you know, intensive vegetable production, then we got to get in there and, and seed it um, for something. So that's just kind of a little backdrop of how we've managed things. So depending on if you can get in the fall and get it planted and get it established, that's so, awesome. So you can see here when the pasture was first coming up, you know, it was warm weather was coming. So you know, lamb's quarters was popping up and velvet leaf was popping up. And, you know, and then I started looking because we were running sheep ahead of the chickens to keep the grass in check instead of mowing. That was part of the, part of the grant. And then I'm like, okay, what's the protein content of lamb's quarters for sheep? It was actually really high. And I was like, okay, as long as it's lush and young, they'll eat it. And they did. And so, you know, so who, you know, you'll raise layers, you put birds in an area too long, you know, they're going to do that. Um, you'll see these birds are actually have a, have a de-beaking and I can, we can talk about that stuff later. Our birds now don't, but, um, you know, so you can see some plantain in there and you can see, you know, some, some white, uh, Dutch white clover. Yeah. And the point of this too is again, it's, you know, talking about pasture management and things, but it's also related to the systems management of how much you're moving the birds. So people always want to know how much land do I need for how many birds and whatever else. Well, it's really based on the impact that they're doing on the, on the land and the ground. And if you're not really moving your coops very often and they're trying to get under out of the direct sun and in the shade, they're gonna do a lot of impact underneath your structures. And so it can quickly damage the pasture. And you don't wanna have these big chunks of your field that all of a sudden are denuded of anything that's not gonna come back because it's compacted and gross and whatever. So, you know, we do have some sacrifice areas in some of the, broil in the layer fields where they're just, you know, digging huge dust, dust baths and whatever, but then if you're going to go back and renovate and fill in holes with more soil and reseed it and do all that good stuff, it's just part of the, the effort. So this grant, I wrote, I mean, so integrating poultry and sheep on vegetable cropping land for increased economic return and enhanced fertility. I wrote this grant because I was working for a vegetable farm and we needed land. And I was trying to convince the guy who owned the property that, because he didn't want to put land into um, too much rotation because he wanted to continue to get a cash crop off it by growing vegetables. And we said, well, We'll lease the land from you. We'll take care of the land. We'll put the pasture down. And then we're going to add organic fertility down on the pasture. You won't have to manage it. You won't have to put the cover crop down. We'll do all that. We'll manage the field. We'll extract the cash crop in the form of meat. And then you can have it back. And so we got the grant. He said, OK, fine, write a grant. So I wrote a grant. And I said, oh, you got it. And he said, really? <laughs> so, <laughs> so it kind of forced his hand to like, give us the field. So we were able to pay him to take the field out of production and, and let us do this. So this is why we were kind of in a rush to get the field, the pasture established. We bought a few lambs and, and, uh, and, and off we went. So. And there they are. 
It wasn't as perfect as we had hoped, and we were really hoping. I mean, part of the other thing about pasture management is timing, too, and making sure that it's, you know, the pasture is growing at the right height for the chickens, because chickens are not going to walk through a field with, you know, waist-high stuff. So you're either going to have to mow it, or you're going to move them through quickly. You know, for broiler coops like ours are, you know, you're pulling them over forage and things. You don't want it to be too tall, all that good stuff. So we were hoping that by integrating the sheep ahead of the broilers, we wouldn't have to actually spend fossil fuel and time driving around with a mower mowing the fields ahead of the broilers, we could just turn the sheep in and they would graze it perfectly in front of the broilers. But that was a year where it was, this is a really droughty field. It's not irrigated, really sandy soils, very dry. And we never could quite get the timing just right to make sure the sheep had enough forage. And then they weren't too far ahead of the chickens. And so someone else could probably figure out the stocking density and do this really perfectly. But um, it, it wasn't really working for so us. So we were basically running the broiler coops behind it, strip grazing the sheep ahead of it, six or eight sheep, um, you know, giving them 20 feet in their shelter because it's a very public field. Everyone's looking to make sure they have sh food and water and all that kind of stuff. And then, so they were just marching through the field. So we did soil testing in this field and uh, we saw, a sl I'm not sure why, but we saw a slight bump in, um, in organic matter over the three years we ended up doing it. We went from in that one year, and it was probably just the soil sample variability, you know, a couple of uh, tenths of a percent from 3.7, 3.9, 3.6, 3.9. And then we saw bumps in. So if you look up um, nutrient content of manure, nutrient content of manure from laying hens, calcium levels are way up compared to broilers because of the calcium in the feed. And so you, you control trials. So you can see there's a jump in calcium too. Um, other nutrients I think were kind of stable or up and down. But so we definitely see a little bit of bump in calcium, a little bit of bump in organic matter. Um, so this is a field that we rent from the town of Concord that was really neglected for a long time. Um, and we, you know, a lot of times I choose you know, I don't want to go into a field and put a lot of money into it right away, so I'll take whatever species are there and just try and improve them and really run the chickens back and forth. And this field was in pretty horrible shape. Um, very little clover uh, and a lot of uh, bed straw because it's just been neglected. And the birds loved the bed straw and they ate everything that was there. And we just kept running them round and round and round. And you'll see, you can see here a little bit dip there. They really dug this field up, but no one else was using it, and we just kind of left it there and just kept running the birds through and let whatever natural species were in there come up. All right, so these are just some other yeah. um, pasture blends that folks can use. Obviously, clovers themselves, if you can keep clover stands in your fields, very palatable, high protein, impact the flavor of the meat and eggs in a, in a tremendous way. Did you say earlier that the Orchard grass wasn't good for birds, but then it was in that mix. Or it was in the mix because I didn't know. Because it was there. What, what's not good about orchard grass is it's a clumping grass, and as it gets established, it's really clumpy. Uh -huh. Really productive, great for ruminants to munch on, but if you're trying to pull a coop forward over it, it just sucks. So this is that field that we, it tends to be a really dry field a few years ago. We show this, fo this, sh this slide at conferences or whatever because there's a lot of people who are doing pasture raised <laughs> now who aren't. And we move our birds every day. So this is our coops, this is our three ton mobile silo with a water tank behind it. And so this is about, this is a, about a nine acre field. Uh, and we just kind of arc the birds and just kind of keep going round and round and round. This field is also shared with um, some cows that the owner who owns the field, he just throws about nine or 10 cows a year. So then, um, and over the time, over time, I mean, th this was just basically a cow loafing ground. So the pasture quality there was horrible and lots of multiflora rows and weed species because of course the cows eat all the good stuff and then all the other crap grows and no one was mowing it. So after we started using this field, adding tons of fertility, going out, clipping the stuff ahead of the chickens all the time, it's become a really lovely pasture. The land trust was very excited that, that we were doing it. But we definitely move the birds every day. 
So broiler breeds, a lot of them out there. Um, we're going to go into a little bit more detail about the different strains of them. But um, we right now have settled on the Cornish Cross and a Freedom Ranger are the two types of broiler breeds that we raise. We've done a bunch of other ones over the years. Pete loved the Naked Necks. We've done some Striped Birds, some Kosher Kings. Um, what other We've ones? done different strains of the Freedom Ranger. We've done different strains of the Cornish. We've done a slow growing black broiler. We've done um, some slow growing whites. We've gone all through. But mainly we've settled on the Cornish and the Freedom Ranger because some of our customers want that big breast. Um, you know, some of our customers who are like diehard organic farmers, you think that they want the Freedom Ranger for a lot of reasons, but they just want that big plump bird. We hate growing them, but they just, they're profitable to grow and customers want them. And we're here to run a business and sell stuff that people want to buy. So, but right now, it, it's about 50-50, so. Yeah, so we give people a choice and that drives what they order. So these are kind of just thinking about yourself and you know, what are your goals? Are you not you know, refusing to grow the, what is the whole thing that's going around right now? Exploding like chicken. we're, you know, we're not gonna sell exploding chickens, yes. So you could certainly not do that, but what's your market, who's gonna buy it? And then understanding the strengths and weaknesses of each and then market, meet, meet your business potential, all that good stuff we just mentioned. And then, you wanna go through the pros and cons or? Are people familiar with uh, all the bird breeds? You want us to go through them at all? No, so Cornish is a standard. If you go to a supermarket, you're buying, you're eating a Cornish bird. There's a million strains of the Cornish cross. Um, it is made, it made, it is hybridized by a lot of big companies, uh, multinational companies. And if you go on their websites, so you can see all the data on each strain and what it's for. There's a strain that's grown for the Caribbean market that's meant to tolerate really hot weather. There's strains that are grown for the cut-up market because it grows at a different rate and has a bigger breast. There are strains for everything you can think of. Um, the red broilers, there are several strains. Some come from France. Hubbard has bought the strain from La Belle Rouge program in France, and that's the, what we buy. There's an Italian version of it that's slightly different. Uh, we don't think it tastes as, well, uh, tastes as good. Um, but Again, there's strains of all these, and then there's strains within the red broilers of, again, you can go on their website and you can see all the parent stock and how they're manipulating it constantly. So we deal with a hatchery in Pennsylvania that she, it's a very small place, she's very tuned into what's going on in the genetics world, and there's a few hatcheries that you can call and say, hey, I'm interested in this, can you tell me what is going on? And a lot of times hatcheries are buying from other hatcheries and buying from other hatcheries and you don't know what the heck you're getting. So we've ended up with this hatchery that we know where it's coming from, who's sourcing it, what's going on with the strain, so we have consistency in what we're, what we're growing. What hatchery is it? So it's, it's a Diane Myers, Myers Poultry Farm. Southport, Pennsylvania. Uh, yeah, she's a really nice lady. It's her and her daughter. They do a lot of, um, they do their own Cornish, but they do a lot of um, brokering. brokering for New York City. Um, ethnic markets. She does a lot of different kinds of colored broilers and she could really tell you. She does a lot of, she does caponizing. She's been doing this since she's a kid. And she's a really nice lady. And she's the one who answers her phone, her or her daughter. And um, we just like dealing with them. And, you know, and a lot of times too, people will get, you know, the, the market's shifting and there's not chicks available. She'll kind of call me and we can talk through, okay, there's a shortage in this market because you know, this happened in someone's layer, it's a layer house, and all the birds got crushed, and so on and so forth, and she'll let you know what's really what's going on. So we grow, and she distributes the Hubbard um, yield. It's, is that the yield? It, we grow a bird that's meant for the cut-up market. Um, it's a high-yield strain, which is what that is. So it's meant to be grown as a bigger bird for cut-up for the huge breast. We like it because we tend to grow our birds bigger and so the really, the way that that grows different is that it, it's got a, um, it grows a little bit slower in the beginning and it, to build its um, bone strength and it's got really strong legs. So we have very few leg problems in broilers, which is very, in, in Cornish, which is very common. So we grow um, Cornish to seven and a half weeks and depending on the time of year, because of light, we talked about light a little bit, light variability. We'll at that weight, at that um, seven and a half weeks, we'll get anywhere from 
4.8 to a seven something pound bird. What's that? Dress, or what? dress, yes, dress. dress? No. Yeah, we do, sometimes we do male, sometimes we do straight run. If you do straight run, you'll get, a, you'll get some natural variability in weight. So if some customers want a smaller bird, then they can get them that way. Um, if you want to just get monster birds all the time, you just buy males. So layer breeds, there's a lot. Bazillion. <laughs> in the beginning, we were like buying from Martin McMurray and let's get the rainbow breed. And then you have these birds that they're dumping on you because, you know, they want to give you a uh, silver spangled Hamburg, which is this game bird and can fly 30 feet in the air. And <laughs> Target practice, so avoid flighty, nervous, high energy. <laughs> high energy. All the nice descriptions, you're like, oh yeah, that's a clue. Yeah, so we, we've ended up going to what uh, most people who do production is a red sex link or um, high brown. It's a standard brown egg layer uh, in the industry. And um, they're good birds. They're very friendly. They ray, lay, lay uh, rapidly a very large brown egg. And we get them custom grown for us and a few other farms at a hatchery um, in Pennsylvania, grown to 16 weeks. And then as soon as we get them, we feed them organic and put them on pasture. So our customers know that. We don't, so they're not de-beaked, which is very rare, um, but they're custom grown for a bunch of us, um, about eight or 10,000 for a group of farmers down in Southern New Hampshire and, and Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Turkeys, forage. Oh, yeah, I mean, we're buying, there's a local turkey farm in Massachusetts um, that has their own strain of a slow-growing uh, broad-breasted white. You know, some people frown on broad-breasted white, but this strain is really slow-growing. We get it in June-ish, and we slaughter end of October. We sell the birds frozen. We just don't want to tolerate having birds on pasture. There's no pasture in that, you know, by Thanksgiving anyway, so it's just easier for us to slaughter them. Not as easy to sell turkeys frozen, but... Um, we decided for now we're just doing the the, uh, the broad breasted white, the slow strain. Yeah. Could you do uh, talk about the economics of the cornage versus the rangers? I mean, I know there's this 20 cent difference in the price. Yeah, the economics. About labor and yeah, well, labor is this much. You know, for, for broilers, you know, your labor for us in our system, you know, in the pens, you know, 60, 70 birds per pen to move a pen feed them, water them, is like four minutes of coop per day. So to drag, a, I'd much rather drag a coop for an extra week and get an extra pound to make an extra seven bucks multiplied over all those birds than, than not. I mean, we can, I'd, ra I'd much rather grow them a little bit longer and have the extra labor because you, your payback is huge, even if their feed conversion is not as good. But for the Cornish, you know, usually we're getting you know, at least a pound more on uh, finished weight than our Freedom Ranger, which is actually a week, a week and a half older. Mm -hmm. But it's our market. You know, we need, our customers want to buy the Freedom Ranger, our customers want to buy the Cornish. So Cornish is definitely more profitable to raise. Your mortality is definitely higher. You know, so maybe we'll lose, you know, eight, you know, seven, eight percent on, on Cornish that are having heart attacks late in the season if you're, we haven't managed our light or our feed regimen correctly. And then, um, you know, our soil mortality is higher on Cornish and lower on Freedom Rangers. Um, so the, the higher mortality in the Cornish, you know, reduces our profitability a little bit, but not, not so much that it's still not, you know, worth it for, to grow them, you know, so. But you still think even with your price, of, I mean, it's, it's a pretty small price difference. But yeah. You would say that, that the Cornish are more profitable. They're more profitable, but we now have demand for both. We don't. We should have a higher price for our Freedom Rangers, but you know we've gotten to six ninety nine, and and we're just like ah, seven dollars a pound. You know, if we do a really good job, we have actually um, a family that grows a few birds for us using our system, our grain. They do it to reduce their taxes on their property, and we've shown them how to do everything, and they grow a really small amount of birds just for us that we buy from them, and she. Is, she's like an MIT engineer and is like, I gave them 1.9 ounces today and 1.64 ounces yesterday. And she's like really on it. And her birds are killer. They're, 
the, she goes, they're she's, perfectly uniform. She's just grown Queen like, Rangers. Yeah. She's grown males. They're like, when we slaughter them, they're like 5.5, 5.5, 5.5, 5.5. It's amazing. But it really, it actually having this relationship with them has shown me that I'm not doing nearly as good a job on the scale as I should be because my consistency is more variable. And we're, she's getting the same exact birds. So it really has taught me the lesson that if you're a really good manager, like she is, it can really can impact your profitability. She'll raise a, bird, a group of 165, and she's like, ah, I lost one. <laughs> really, I'm, I'm not kidding. You know? So she'll get 165 in the mail, 170, and she'll brood you know, 168, and she'll lose one of a heart attack in the field, and it's just amazing. So, and her birds consistently are bigger than ours. So, um, but yeah, we can get feeder mangers at nine and a half weeks, six pounds and change, six and a half pounds. You know, we're feeding, you know, certified organic from Green Mountain, um, paying 750 a ton, you know, but it's, it's, it's worth it. I don't know anyone who's doing birds of more than a thousand that aren't using the standard brown egg layer. I mean, everyone is because Hello, it's been hybridized and is using, you, you know, it, it's just, it, it's a good bird overall. Um, I would love to, you know, when we first started, like everyone else, we were doing rainbow colored eggs and brown eggs and we had some leghorns, we had some aracanas. Aracanas are nice birds, they don't lay well, they're really sweet, you know, uh, but it would be great to have like one blue egg in our carton, but you know what, we're selling all the eggs we want to sell with just doing brown eggs. And so, you know, it's, it's in a perfect world. I would love to have some barred rocks out there and some araconas out there. And when we, we started, started doing this um, buying club or buying group thing too, we were like hope, hoping that they could do a brown feathered bird one year and a white feathered bird the next year. Oh, no. So then we could, if we were, because we unfortunately had to merge our flocks at some point because we just didn't have the facilities to like do a, two separate flocks every year, which you should do. Um, uh, and then we could have had them paid to be banded. banding, yeah. And so now we have enough... Now we have six or seven or eight or nine now mobile coops, so we have enough to segregate. So when new birds are coming in in the spring, we keep them totally separate, and then we can. Yeah. Buy one all in all. yeah, and just you know, productivity-wise, then the birds get lost within each other, and you're holding onto these birds that are laying lightly tinted eggs, and the crack rate goes way up, and it's just not worth it. I think so. We're, we're actually now, and people who are doing what we're doing are getting, are rotating their flocks out faster. Yeah. You know, we were, we're getting birds now, uh, end of April. To be honest, it would be great to get rid of those birds in November. Yeah. It's just not, we keep them until like, historically we've kept them up until like July, August, and by then the eggs are really light, you get a lot of yeah, cracking, a lot of variability, yeah, birds. Birds are, are dying off from getting, um, you know, just issues with eggs stuck and all kinds of stuff. So it's just better to rotate birds out. But you need to have, you know, the market the infrastructure. Right. How many birds would you like to bring in and how often? So we have 1,200 coming right now in the end of April. One big group. One big group. Um, you know, then you get all those pullet eggs. So the problem is that you're getting all those pullet eggs, you need your old flock that's laying regular sized eggs because not everyone wants to buy a pullet egg in the beginning and, and you know until you have that six week period of them sizing up you need regular sized eggs too. So ideally we'd probably get a big group in April and a big group in September. November or September like and then two years ago. swap that out. Right. So your birds in September, yep. keep them through the winter laying strong and get rid of them you know, early summer. But it's a lot of birds to move to the, even to the ethnic market. And then, oh, sure. and then you're, if you can get, you know, 10 bucks, 12 bucks, whatever, and then you're dumping the other birds at a lower rate to keep all the... the you guys uh, ever take them to auction if you ever... I never have. Or getting them out the door? Yeah. No. You haven't had to. You haven't had to. Mm -hmm.